As you can tell from my strange speech impediment, I am not from around these parts. <laughs> I originally come from the south of England. From Liverpool. Oh, there's a couple of us from Blighty here. Excellent. Yeah, great. Uh, and I'm not here to take the colonies back for the Queen. <laughs> Although I've started to think about it. Um, but I'm delighted to say that the ink on my new American passport is still wet. I became a citizen in April. Uh, thank you very much. After 12 years. Now, um, I was an idiot. I did it the legal way. And I have been asked by Jay, thank you Jay, where do you go, for this opportunity to talk a little bit about my experience as a legal immigrant to this country. Doing it the hard way. Now, just to be clear, it's actually very easy to become an immigrant to the United States if you have a family member here, which of course includes a husband or a wife, right? So the chain immigration thing, as I'm sure you all know, is very real. Yeah? And there's obviously a huge incentive to get one member of the family across the border, make him or her legal, and then you bring the rest in legally. Um, that's the easiest way to become an American, if you are not born one. The second easiest way is asylum. And a very large number of countries uh, can, you know, send, or you know, from, a, from a very large number of countries come people who claim um, economic or religious or political asylums. Right? There are uh, various ways of doing that. The last time I checked the figure, only 9%, think about this, of, American, of immigrants to the United States were actually here doing that American dream thing. Here on, only because of that the application was based on business and or investment or employment. Nine, 9%. So it's all about the chain immigration and the asylum. Now, I uh, met a new friend on the table here from uh, Taiwan, um, and uh, it is worth mentioning, perhaps, in relation to this, that in Taiwan, uh, just a, as a coincidence, as an example, which is not a third world country, it is a developed country, I've lived in Taiwan. Um, they're not short of the luxuries of life in Taiwan. The country's a little bit densely packed, but it's a great place to live. Um, they run classified ads in the newspapers on a regular basis, inviting only eight month pregnant women to come to learn English in America. That's a first world country. The world is laughing at us. All right? And they're taking full advantage. And why wouldn't they, right? Because let's say if I was a poor Mexican and I had a responsibility to my family, and I knew that the way of maximizing my chance to become a legal immigrant was to be an illegal one first, which is the case, about one in two legal Mexican immigrants were here illegally, um, I would do it too. And it would be the right thing to do for my children. It's not the right thing. So what I'm saying here is, it's the responsibility of our nation to get this right. And now I get to say our nation. Isn't that cool? I don't have to say your nation. Um, and uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about this. Because the only people, when you get, you know, CCNN or Fox News or MSNBC, right, the immigration debate, what do you see? You see the, usually the Hispanic person who takes one position based on ethnicity, stroke, race, right? Okay. Human, human enough. And then you have whoever, whoever is on the other side of that. Um, I mean, it's not a coincidence, perhaps, that the Trump campaign, we've heard about Trump here today already, really sparked with that controversial comment about immigration, right? I mean, there's a reason why I'm, I'm not taking a stand on Trump's policy or what he said, but there's a reason for that. And um, actually, Usually, I'm not talking about my immigration stories, usually I'm talking about, um, as Jake uh, said, uh, how to win supporters and not arguments. 
And um, the way to win supporters if you're a political insurgent is to point, is to reflect back to a disaffected population um, an offense against their basic human sense of justice. And what Trump did fits perfectly in that because what he was doing was reflecting back to people who perhaps couldn't articulate it in, these, in this way, that people who break rules, getting stuff that people who don't break rules don't get, isn't fair. That's basically it. You saw, by the way, Sanders, you see, by the way, Bernie Sanders doing this on a different issue on the other side. Uh, in my native land, Britain, you have just seen, praise be, Nigel Farage take the country out of the European Union by doing exactly this, <laughs> by saying to the folks of Britain, he wasn't teaching them some new political philosophy. That wasn't what he was about. He just tapped into the fact that you don't need a political ideology to feel, and I say feel advisedly, not to think, to feel that rules being made for my life by people in a foreign country that I can't deselect is an offense against the basic human sense of justice. Farage, Trump, Bernie, doesn't matter what the politics are, it's the psychology that's important, right? Okay, so, but back to my CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC, these are the two, the two sides of the immigration debate. And I think both sides have a vested interest in having you, we, all think that it's really complicated to solve, right? I don't believe it is, and I've been through it. The only people who actually know about American immigration are the mugs like me that went through it, right? Yeah? Now, of course the Americans don't know, because how would you engage it, right? The illegal immigrants don't know, because, well, they didn't engage it. But as a legal immigrant, may I suggest that perhaps the biggest incentive to illegal immigration is the legal immigration system. <laughs> <laughs> because what happened to me was utterly inhumane. <laughs> I'm strategically taking a sip of good English Earl Grey at this point. <laughs> and I don't really know where to start. Because there are so many stories. Have any of you here read um, Franz Kafka's The Trial? You know the, do you know, you know the adjective Kafka-esque? Yes. Okay, you know what it means, right? It's, it's being caught up in a system that's impossible to understand, that just dumps injustice on you and you never have a clue why. That's what the entire, I just told you what the, the trial is, the book. Right, that's what it is. And it doesn't have a happy ending. Um, the closest thing to that in real life is the American legal immigration system. If you are not doing chain immigration, if you're not married, right? And of course, a lot of people do that. They get married because they can't be doing with all of this nonsense, some of which I'm about to tell you about. Um, so when I begun this odyssey to become American, um, I, I began after six immigration attorneys told me not even to start because I was British, so I couldn't claim asylum. I... Uh, <laughs> didn't have any family here, so that's my, I'm already down to the, that 9%, right? And I didn't want to go and get a job with Goldman Sachs in London for seven years and then get them to transfer me to the United States on a work transfer, which puts me in the other 9%, right? So they said, well, just forget about it. But I did find, um, I did find a paralegal, an immigration paralegal, come consultant, who thought that he would, he, I don't know, I think he just fancied a bit of a challenge. And I basically laid him out all the components of my life, and he had nothing to lose, so I was paying him, and um, he said, all right, let's, let's give this a punt. Now, um, this is being recorded, and I've only told parts of this story, I've never told this in America, and um, I have only told this in a hacker's commune in Bratisla Bratislava, and um, I made sure they turned off all their recording devices, um, so I'm not going to be sharing you how I beat the illegal immigration system, but I did it completely legally. That's what you need to know. And I did it with the help of, um, I did it with the help of this paralegal. I could not have done it on my own. An attorney, interestingly, would not have helped me do this because, well, an attorney, why would an attorney bother when he's got easy standard cases to do, right? You know, Goldman Sachs pays the trans, you know, the legal fees. You know, why take on this guy who's um, doing it very creatively? But anyway, I did it, and with the help of this gentleman called Greg. And 
I started with an application uh, for an L1A visa, which is an international uh, business executives visa. That's what it's for. So it's the visa that actually, I don't know why I'm picking on Goldman Sachs today, but if you are a Goldman Sachs director or senior manager, um, and they move you from, let's say, the London office to an office in the United States, you will be here on the L1A, right? So it's, it's nearly always used for big multinationals, transferring people to sister or subsidiary companies, large foreign corporations. With me so far, that was the path we took. And there were particular technical reasons why we thought, if we're gonna you know, throw this Hail Mary pass, we will do it this way. Um, but I do remember getting instructions from Greg as to you know, the first of my applications for this L1A visa, which had to be renewed uh, two or three times before I could apply for the right to apply for the green card, before applying for the green card, before getting the green card, which you need before you can apply to become a citizen. Um, yeah, that's right. Oh, I guess that is so much better. Uh, so, the first time I got this, these uh, instructions from Greg, of all the things I had to compile, and I had to compile all kinds of stuff, I, um, at his request, I sent him the documents, right? It's like page list, pages of lists of you know, photographs of the offices where he'll be working, of the furniture, of the, um, the organizational structure of the company uh, that you used to work for in the country before you came to America. The whole thing, the whole thing, the whole thing, right? And I, um, I did all this, I sent it back to him, and then he would send it back to me with a legal cover letter. And this request. I need another three quarters of an inch. <laughs> I had no clue what he meant. So I called up Greg, with whom I normally correspond with, uh, by email. And I said, I, I, I got you. I, it's all clear, but I didn't understand the last line of your letter, three quarters of an inch. He said, yeah, it's not thick enough. The application's not thick enough. I didn't know three quarters of an inch paper. <laughs> I am not making this up. And I said, well, what, you want me to just print stuff off. Um, he said, well, basically, it has to be kind of vaguely relevant to what you've been doing here in America. But we told these people, I said, why? He said, well, the people who are going to be assessing this really complicated um, pile of papers that you're submitting, most of them only have a high school diploma. <laughs> they need to check the boxes, but they're not going to understand what they're checking. This guy has done this for a living for many years. So I actually went around the internet and printed off every website that had a link to anything that I had done in the United States in my first year and again in my third year and again in my fifth. And um, so the papers were his papers, or my papers with his cover letter would come from his office to me in an envelope. I would add the three quarters of an inch and I would send them off to the Department of Homeland Security in a box, because they didn't fit in a right? And so it went on. Um, until one, <laughs> so, so you do this three times, right? And I should make it clear that if your visa is denied, right, so you're trying to set up a life, you're trying to set up a business. By the way, I couldn't legally be employed all this time. So I'm earning a living through my business, but I cannot supplement my income legally with a job. And as I said, I did this completely legally, so I didn't, I didn't break any rules, all right? So I legally sustained myself without legal employment. So I was kind of freelancing and whatever, right? Now this is very hard if you're setting up a business, of course. Because if you're setting up a business, everybody knows that most businesses don't, well, most businesses don't make any money ever, because 90% of them close. But even the ones that don't, in the first three years, they're not in profit, right? So, um, uh, and by the way, to fund this madness, I sold my first property in England and transferred all the money into a bank account in California. And, um, you know, to show these uh, people with their high school diplomas in the Department of Homeland Security that I had money and that this was, you know, bona fide. Right? Um, so there was one, one, of, uh, one of these renewals, right? So I get my own one of these the first time, then you need the second time, then you need it the third time before you can apply for the right to apply for the green card, before you can apply for the system. Um, I received a letter that said, um, 
that said I had been approved for visa, and uh, that the actual visa document, so this is to allow me to be a legal, legal resident, obviously, and conduct my business there, uh, was in the mail, except that the document had claimed. So I called the Department of Homeland Security, well, yeah, I called the Department of Homeland Security. You, you, know, you, you pure call one of these numbers and you, well, you get into the Kafka's and trial, but eventually you maybe talk to somebody. And you um, say that, I, you know, that the, the visa hasn't come. I can see online that it's been approved. You've sent me the document saying it's been approved. I just need the actual document. And they say, oh, well, well um, you need to send us $200 and we'll print it off for you again. So you send us $200 and then you wait. And they don't send it to you. And then you chase it up again, right? And then they send you another letter asking you for more evidence. Um, to approve the L1A visa that they've already approved and it's already saying on the website that they've approved. But now they're asking you to go through the process again. But you've just been through a couple of months before with your, oh, however many inches in the box and the thousands of dollars you paid for paralegal. And you're saying, yeah, but it's already approved. It's a, it doesn't work, right? Because you're ever sending the letters to the person on the phone, nothing, nothing works. Well, this visa that had been approved, that I was waiting for, um, uh, I didn't get the document, and I needed it to leave the country. Now, this is an international executive manager's visa, right? So I'm here legally to conduct international business. And I can only get the visa because I also have a business in my home country of England. So the visa's been approved. You would think I could just get on a plane, go and conduct some business in England. I needed to, this was the first time I needed to leave the US. And come back with my piece of paper which I don't yet have, by the way, remember. Um, and just come to and fro, because that's the whole point of being an international businessman, right? No. No, no, it doesn't work like that. Um, well, first of all, I had to get the piece of paper that had the visa on it to allow me to leave the country. Couldn't get it. The, the, the weeks turned to months, and I was starting to pull my hair out, because I was now a prisoner in a country that I couldn't leave me working, right? So... I start telling my friends frantically that I've got this problem, and one of my friends is um, dear, dear man. Uh, you may have heard of him. Uh, certainly, more senior of you may have. A guy called Barry Farber, uh, conservative talk show host, prize-winning talk show host, um, who I got to know when I lived in New York. And I told him that I was frantically trying to get this piece of paper that had the visa on it that they tell me has already been approved, that I paid the $200 for just so they can hit print again on the printer that they haven't done, and I was been waiting, waiting for it for months. And he said, this is an absolute abomination. Um, he said, I'm going to just start calling my friends and see if I can help you. Well, sure enough, Barry um, knows someone who knows someone who knew the council for the senator of North Carolina at the time. And Barry told the council of the senator what I, well, actually, he put us in touch, and then I, the council for the senator, um, this is a US senator, right? I'm not gonna say senator, it's a US senator, uh, sent me an email and said, um, I've heard that you've got a terrible situation going with um, the visa, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, could you please send me the application number? Uh, maybe I can help. So, I did. And three days later, the visa arrived in my mailbox. <laughs> and this lady, the council, forwarded me uh, a response from the person in the Department of Homeland Security whom she had contacted on my behalf. And the first line of this email, and I don't think she should have sent it to me, said, um, thank you so much for using the special senator's line for expediting immigration applications. <laughs> <laughs> Now, if I didn't know Barry, and he didn't know somebody who knew somebody who knew the council of the Senate of North Carolina, um, I may not be a citizen right now. Um, but anyway, then I had the piece of paper. So now I can leave, right? I actually wanted to leave to go into my best friend's wedding. But I couldn't, because that visa was not actually physically glued into my passport. So now I need to make an appointment to get the, piece of, the visa on the piece of paper transferred into the passport so they can leave the country. Now this is an international businessman's visa, right? Um, but the problem is, I'm not American, so I have to go to a consular or embassy out of the country. 
but I'm in America and I want to go to England. Well, there's only so many consulates and embassies with so many appointments on this continent. There can service people who've got, who need to do stupid things like me because the immigration system's got insane, right? And any given, in any given 24 hour period, any one of these consulates or embassies in, well, North America, so I'm now looking at Mexico and Canada, right? In any 24 hour period, they've only got a few of those that you can book yourself into, right? So at midnight, or whatever time it was, in the maybe it was three in the morning, it was the middle of the night, day after day, I was up on the websites. They have these embassies in Canada have booking sites, right? And you check online to see if an appointment's become available for whatever, however many months out. So midnight or three or whatever time it was at night, days, I'm not, and then sure enough, at some point in Vancouver, an embassy has an appointment however many months out. I can now fly to Vancouver to get transferred this visa that I have on this piece of paper that I paid $200 for, maybe six months for, that Senator's Council made it into the passport so that I can leave to go see my friend's wedding in the country of my birth. But, <laughs> the guy at the embassy has the legal right to deny the visa that you've already got. That you've already got. So, I go to Vancouver, I book a hotel for two nights, because I have to have the, the whole thing, right? So I have the whole thing, this box, the box of evidence that I gave to get my L1A visa renewal, whichever number it was, first or second renewal, right? The whole thing, I'm now going to hand over to a guy in Vancouver who doesn't know me from Adam, and then he's going to determine whether he wants to move this visa on from this piece of paper into my passport so I can actually go and do the thing that the visa supposedly allows me to do, which is going out of the country. And I hand it over and I sit there, terrified in the hotel room, right? Because if anybody at any point decides to deny this, you've got 30 or 60 days to leave. Your life's done, that's it. You want to buy a house? Forget about it. You want to build a relationship and have a girlfriend? Forget about it. Just want to have friends, right? You've got this sword of Damocles hanging over you. Every one or two years, each time you do this renewal, which is being assessed by people who my professional immigration paralegal says only have a high school diploma. Right? You see why I'm not doing it the legal way. It's just so much easier to walk over the board, isn't it? <laughs> I got my visa transferred into my passport. By that time I missed my friend's wedding. So it was all for now. But it did me a good story to tell all my American friends um, <laughs> who might be interested in the politics of immigration. <clears throat> so it goes on, so it goes on, so it goes on. And eventually I get my green card and uh, I'm obviously missing out lots of the story. Um, but the green card's the hard bit, right? Once you've got the green card, all you have to do literally is stay out of jail for five years. And then it's just paperwork to become a citizen at that point. Paperwork. So, I wasn't at all bothered when I paid my $800 on top of all the thousands that I spent over 12 years, obviously, from renewal after renewal after renewal. Oh, no, let me... There was the year when I got my green card, where I had the very bizarre experience of telling my accountant to maximize my income for that year and my tax bill and not minimize it because I, as a legal immigrant, had to show that I was not a welfare risk. <laughs> you never want to be getting a cabinet to maximize your tax bill. It hurts to write that check. It's the biggest tax check I wrote. Um, maybe, maybe people fall or sins, actually. Um, yeah, so, so they're the kind of things you do if you do a legal. But anyway, so I... Um, I uh, Last, now about what, a couple of years ago, even half ago, I'm now, you know, I've stayed out of jail for five years. Um, my political activism somehow hasn't put me in a FEMA camp, so that was good. And, um, <laughs> and you know, I did my time, and I just sent in my $800, $700 with my simple paperwork to get my citizenship interview, right? Um, that's funny, I'll talk a bit about that when I'm done. And... And it's kind of a big deal, right? Because my life 
hasn't really been my life for the first five years for that, right? I can't just get on with a normal life because some school kid could throw me out of the country. Um, but now, I see now the light against the tunnel, I'm going to be an American. Uh, so I send it off, I get the letter back from Department of Homeland Security, come in to the office in Tequila, get your retinas scanned, your fingerprints done. By the way, I've had my retinas scanned by authorities in this country dozens of times. I don't know why they keep doing it. Uh, they obviously think I'm replacing my eyes or something. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is a legal immigrant is what you go through whenever you enter or uh, you enter the country, right? And not only when you enter the country. So, um, but this is the last time I'm going to have to have my retina scan, so I'm quite delighted about this. So I go off to the, the place and uh, get it, you know, get a fingerprint, whatever, right? High tech, right? Yeah. And, uh, and then I wait, and they tell me, you know, the time frame is whatever it was, three months or six months, you'll get your letter. Um, so you do the retina scan, and, and then they, they do your background check, right? And once they clear you, then you come in for the interview. When you pass the interview, they give you a date, you can take the oath. That's it, you're done, right? So just all I have to do is sit tight. So the three months go by, the six months go by, and I'm online, because they've got a little portal online, and you can trace your application. And it said very clearly on this website that the lag time for citizenship applications under my class was whatever it was, I say three months, and here I am at nine months. And there's nothing, I haven't got my letter, so I have the pleasure of calling the um, Franz Kafka, I mean the Department of Homeland Security hotline again, and I say, where's the, you know, what's going on? Um, well, they don't know, but somebody writes something down on a piece of paper. And, and sure enough, um, as they said, uh, I would, I did get a letter from them in two weeks telling me that because I hadn't turned up for my original retinal scan and fingerprints appointment, my application will be deemed to have been abandoned at the cost of me of $800, um, unless, unless um, I come in on a certain, certain day to have my retinal scanned uh, at they were so kind enough to rebook me for the retina scan that I already did, that they told me I didn't turn up for. Um, and so I could, you know, I could keep my application going. So, um, uh, what do you do, right? Uh, I'm, in, I'm in Kafka's The Trial. What do you do? Well, I call back the uh, Franz Kafka hotline, and I say, uh, okay, you guys are screwed up. I am looking at the paperwork that I have, stamped paperwork, telling me exactly the time I went in originally to get my retina scan and my fingerprints done, right? It's, the, it's all right there, you know, the, the number of the person that did it, the whole thing, it's right there on the paper. I'm holding the paper. And I, and the guy on the, end of the line says, oh, yeah, I don't know. We should probably go to the appointment. Um, so, uh, so I, I'm gonna go to this appointment and say what? Well, you need to find out uh, the person that's handling your, your application, right? It'll be assigned to someone. I said, oh great, well, who's that? Oh, well, we don't know, our computers aren't hooked up to this. Uh, I was like, well, is this the, uh, you know, the customer, customer, that's great, that's great. service uh, line for, you know, keeping in my position? Yeah, but, um, you know, we're just the general line. You need the uh, office. Well, put me through to, the, you know, the local office where your application was. Well, put me through to that. Oh, we, we, can't, we can't do that, so you have to go. So I said, hold on a second, you're telling me that I have to take a day off work to go for an appointment that I've already done to tell the guy that, that he screwed up and I don't need to go to the appointment? I was like, you guys are taking a piss. I got a bit angry because I'm probably 12 years of bottled up at this point. But of course, you know, this is them, right? So um, you, you do it because you don't have a choice. Well, the night before, I had rolled in my head because you know, my thing is political communication. You know, what I teach people to deal, to persuade people who don't want to be persuaded, that's what I do. And I'm about to, give, <laughs> to persuade a government official to give a flying damn about my um, citizenship application. Right? I'm like, this is my hardest test yet, right? Um, because guess what, his salary, is, uh, his bonus does not depend on uh, him doing my paperwork right. <coughs> so, uh, so I went to the office in Tequila, and you go through like these different stages. 
Oh, okay. I've got to, oh, I think it's the best thing. I'm not going to. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, and I say I need to. I speak, need to speak to the guy who's handling my application. Um, you know, you guys are screwed up, and um, you need to speak to G. I need to speak to what? You need to speak to G. Who's G? G's the head honcho. He'll, he'll, he'll sort you out. So um, I get in. I go to the next stage. You know, you go to the second. There's like the first receptionist. And then there's like the inner receptionist, and then you go to your holding thing, where I'm supposed to be held, because they were going to do my records again, right? And I, I was fine, I was looking for G. And um, G was going to apparently help me out. So I find G, and um, I say to G, uh, you screwed up, here's my paperwork, you've already done this, um, where's my application? I should have been, according to your computer, I should have been, your website, I should have been a citizen six months ago. Um, let me look into that. Get some little computer. And, um, well, this is the best bit, I don't have to tell you, so maybe I'll be up, because I'm getting flashed at the back here. But, um, he tells me he'll, she tells me he'll, he'll sort it out. And, uh, and I'm angry. So I'm not going to do this on Wednesday scan because you've got them, right? He said, oh yeah, we've got them. I can see on the computer we've got them. Great. He said, but you should do them again. <laughs> Why? Well, it's been 11 months and they're about to expire. It's like, you mean my retinas are about to expire? <laughs> so I did them again. And he assures me, because I asked, how long is it going to be till I get my letter, invite me in, interview, right? It will only be six weeks and, and I'm watching him on the he's on the computer, he's phoning people, he's doing the whole thing. And um and you know what? He was right. Because six weeks later, this guy G, he was great. He was a New Jersey car salesman and he knew how to talk to people. <laughs> and I actually told him as I was in his office for 50 minutes as he was finding my application, which he assured me they had because he could see it on his computer. Um, that he was in the wrong job. I have no idea how he got through recruitment because he actually seems to care and knows how to talk to people. How did he get a job at the Department of Homeland Security? I have no idea. So we had a little laugh. And I think it's like the fact that I was, oh yeah, oh I can tell you this. This is true, this is true. The first time I go to the Department of Homeland Security to do my retinal scan, right? Take this the right way, but there was about 80 people in there. I was the only white one. Yeah. Now that has some cultural implications, right? There was no English being spoken there. Even though, according to the law, and according to the test you take, which I may not have time to get to, but I really hope you find um, you have to learn, you have to know English to become an American. It's a bad idea, right? So, um, so anyway, but it was much better. The second time I went back, you know for my second retinal scan, so I never went to the first one that I went to? I wasn't the only white person there. I was one of one and a half white people out of about hundred. The other one was a midget. <laughs> I do not suggest. I do not jest. But after 12 years of this, I, I actually just sat in the chair and laughed. I was like, because if I was writing this to go and give speeches about, it wouldn't be as good as the reality. But anyway, she told me I would get my letter in six weeks. And sure enough, I did. In six weeks, I opened my mailbox, and there was the letter saying, you did not come to your appointment to have your retina scanned on the second day. Um, blah, 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 blah. Your application will be uh, deemed to be abandoned unless you come back for your third. So now, now I'm pissed. Really pissed, right? Because what the hell am I supposed to do with this? Where, does, where do you go, right? I mean, I've been in this guy's office. I've looked this guy in the eye. I've spent 50 minutes with him. He's given me names. I've done the whole thing, right? He's playing to me. I've asked him every question I can about this. And I kind of believed it was sorted. I even was there in his office when he took the call from somebody in some other office about, you know, who was... Like he was sorting it out with, right? So the other people involved. How could this happen? So, you know, I get on, on the Franz Kafka trial line. No good. 
So I'm like, okay, well, I'm a writer, right? There's my book, buy it. Um, I, can, I can write. So I write one of those letters that my dear mother would call quite the firm, in which I stated every, you know, everything that had happened, everything they told me they hadn't done, every mistake that had been made in this last part of this process, right? Um, no emotion, matter of fact, except that um, I will now be looking for compensation. Obviously, I'm not going to get compensation from the government. But, you know, th this is a horrendous way to treat people, etc., etc. And decided that I had, having said that then, I had no choice anyway but to go back for my third Red Moscow appointment, right? Now, when I sent this letter, I said, please call me when you receive this letter. Right? Um, we need to sort this out. Of course, that'd be cool. Of course, that'd be cool. So the only way you can even get in there to talk about this problem is to go to your third appointment for this thing. Okay. So there I, so I go in again. So now I know who to ask for. I don't ask for who do I talk to. I'm like, I'm here to talk to G. And G, G vaguely remembered me after I nudged him. And, um, well, sure enough, uh, that was the third time, the, the, the last time I went to the Department of Homeland Security um, office in Tequila. Because uh, that letter that I had sent had actually been received by the office that receives letters. It's not by G, she had never seen it. But somebody somewhere in that Kafka esque system had received my letter. And G was able to tell me on his little computer that. With wide eyes, it must have worked. You've been approved. <laughs> you can come in for interview on such and such a day. So that really, really is the last bit, right? It's really the last bit, right? So, um. But you got your retina scan one more time to be sure, right? <laughs> uh, you know, I kind of lost track of your retina scan. <laughs> so, um. So, sure enough, and sure enough, so after my third appointment, uh, forget um, I get home and right there in my mailbox is the letter. It worked. My, le my letter had worked. And uh, I was approved to come for the interview to take the test to become a citizen. 12 years. 12 years and here's the end of it. Well, so that day, which is the day you take the interview, you do the interview and you become a citizen on the same day in most cases. So this is it. This is the end of my Odyssey right? And I was one of the first interviewees that day. So there's a new agent there now, and his job is to interview me. And uh, I'm nearly done, I'm nearly done, but I am saving the best of all. And um, so, you know, I, I answer my, well, I only, answer, had, only had to answer six of the ten questions about the Constitution. Because mm -hmm. you only have to get six out of ten right, so if you get six out of six, you're done, right? So I did that, and, um, and then I had to do the English test. <laughs> Read this sentence. Sentence what? Who can vote? Write this sentence. He narrated, Americans can vote. I can speak English. And I can read English. Oh, the English text is that. And I have the book, which has the list of English words from which they can make three sentences, three word sentences, right, to test whether you can speak English. By the way, when I was in that office the first time with G, and he told me that um, he had found my application, my application, and it was there, and everything was going to be okay. I said to him, well, that's great. Now I go to the front of the line, right? Because I'm already like, you know, five or six months out of June. And he said, no. And I said, well, why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I be at the front of the line based on where I, when I got in the line, the fact that you guys are screwed up? He said, well, ahead of you will be the people who have already done the interview and failed the English test. <laughs> <laughs> I said, hold on a second, ahead of me. So you mean you invite them back? How much later? He said, usually three weeks. 
I said, right, because they didn't know English three weeks ago, and then they learned the entire language in three weeks. Wow. That's the English test. So you get infinite number of goes at that test. Anyway, but to the, to the end of my story. So then I was in the interview. I'm honestly not making any of this up. And when it was all done, and a gentleman said to me, I am pleased to approve you for American citizenship. He led me out of that part of the building that was, you know, kind of secure for this purpose. And as we got close to the door, he said, your application took a long time. And I said, yes. That's because you lost it. Twice. And he said to me, yeah, it was the salt mines in Missouri. Yeah, that was my reaction. So, what was the salt mines in Missouri? We lost it in the salt mines in Missouri. I said, you lost, I'm very confused. He said, your application was lost in the salt mines in Missouri, and um, that's why you had this problem. And I said, what was my application doing in the salt mines in Missouri? He said, well, salt mines are very stable. So we store all our paper there. Whilst the four agencies that are um, doing your background checks, which, by the way, I've done multiple times at this point, because every visa in Europe, right? I've done the criminal check, the whole thing, I've done all this many times. Right? But now there's four agencies doing my background checks. Um, whilst they're doing that, they hold my application in the salt mines in Missouri, because they're very stable, and they're big. So you can put a lot of paper in there. So I said to the guy, um, but, my retina scans and my fingerprints went into a computer. Are you telling me you print them off and send them to the salt mines in Missouri? This is your government, ladies and gentlemen. This is your government. And the last thing that this gentleman said, that any member of the Department of Homeland Security said to me before I became a citizen was, I think you know, and if you hadn't written that letter, Mr. Kerner, Nobody would have ever known. I rest my case against the government. <laughs> <laughs>